So before um, I jump into specific, you know, questions um, for, for our um, two guests, I just wanted to open up the floor to um, both um, Justice Joe and, and uh, Ming Fun um, to open with any thoughts. Otherwise, we can get into um, more specific um, questions. Uh, <laughs> to kind of uh, no, 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 pai mau o tato o porurangi, katuku whakamihi ki a koutou, uh, i te ata nei mō o koutou whakatau ki a mātou, uh, i tēnei te rangi whakaharahara mā tātou o te rānei, uh, nei rā te mihi. Hoi anō, tautoko ngā mihi ki a tātou ngā hunga ku whitu rangi tia, uh, kei wai ngā tātou uh, o, o te whānu apanui, uh, e noho nei, e noho wahangu kei uh, Tōna kāinga ko tā wira. Ko fiti rangi tia ia, e noho wahangu o ti rā ko ea wāna nei mahi, ngā mōmō mahi ko tutu ki uh, pai rawa atu mā tātou, me ki māna e tuku e nei ngā tāo ngā tuku ki a mātou e pupuri nei. Uh, me ki ka tuku whakamehi ki ngā hunga, uh, hōrapa te whenua ko haere, 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 haere atu rā. Uri rauna ki a tātou, o oh, rawe, ka mutu te marangai. Ka, ka hare wau ki te tiki i whi jowers mō tāku nei pais uh, i te ata nei. Uh, Mārunga pai i kā, um, ka hare wau ki te whenua o mātou uh, campsite, ara te puni uh, o, o tāta pauri. Hoi anō, uh, e tā jau, wai wai ni a tāta ni, i te rātko te tiati. In a nine took it for a mihiki aqui, can we the carhui, not the honori or the queenie, a chukuana kiaku, the katuku for a mihiki aqui, what to mihi, a hapai to Maori or Tate or Altiori. We are no Darren, ka mihiki to carhui are here, Roya, K Altiero, no matter to honori, K Wanga put a data name. No reira te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā tātou katoa. Kia ora matua, Amin. Um, so, yeah, um, moving on from any reflections that, that, that you both had, I wanted to actually um, go into, into following from that video some more personal um, starting points about this relationship. Um, and, I was, and I wanted to actually start with, with, with Matua Ming as well, if you wanted to maybe have a have a call it all um, about what was your relationship um, with learning te reo uh, Māori um, and, and how has that sort of shaped your sort of um, worldview and also your job today? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, um, I think I have it in me genetically that I am interested. Uh, we had a shop at Makaraka and uh, gardens in Matawhiro in Gisborne here. And the majority of our customers were Māori. Uh, they came from the stations, they came from the sharing gangs, they came from their homes. And they used to uh, speak Māori to our family. In fact, all of our family had the opportunity to learn Māori, or Te Reo or Ngāti Pūrō, more particularly, sorry, <laughs> um, because it's different. And they would say, come to the shop and say, Ara, hey, da. hey. and um, and so that, that means, how are you? Um, when I'm at the airport, I say, Kei taha, and the whakautu, the reply is, oh, Kei te tū tonu. Oh, so, ka mōhio wo e hararate no, no Ngāti Pro. Um, so they're not from the coast. But interestingly enough, um, when I went to primary school, um, I said to my Māori mates, um, there weren't many families, and I said, hey, teach me some more Māori. And um, they said, oh, no, we, we don't know any, sorry, uh, because our parents um, aren't teaching us that. And I felt a bit papauri, I felt a bit um, sad by that, uh, because we learned Chinese at home, uh, two dialects, Cantonese and Siyip. And um, from there, when I went to um, Gisborne Intermediate, no kopo of Māori at all. Plenty of Māori kids and a few Māori teachers. But at the end of the day, on the last day of intermediate school, um, Hoodie Callaghan from Omayo said, um, boys, there is uh, Māori classes at uh, Gisborne Boys High School. And if you want to pursue that, 
uh, great. So I said, oh, great. I'm going to, I'm going to be all my mates. Um, so um, I topped the class right throughout high school. And I'm going to say, I want to acknowledge all the pakeke um, at home that have looked after me right through. Um, our kuia, our koroa, uh, they have uh, koipoid me right through my whole journey. And um, then I was um, interesting. Um, I was, we built a police station um, in, in Gisborne in the Kaiti area. And Hemi Hikawai, Māori councillor, said, Oi, come on to council. I said, man, I don't even know what it is. But I said, I'll give it a go. Um, I know one thing about um, Asian people, they don't actually put their hands up uh, for hardly anything, unless they're in their own, own, um, own, their own realm. But generally, um, Māori Pacific Asian kids, um, we don't look at our, our parents when we talk to them. Um, it's, it's quite uh, uh, insolence. And um, anyway, Hemi said, no, no, uh, one of our counsellors will look after you. And, um, you know, this relationship of being a counsellor and getting voted in as counsellor and mayor didn't start on that day. It actually started from the time my parents actually came here. So um, I just want to say, if I didn't have te reo Māori in me, I would not be in the positions that I've had held during my life. I can tell you that now. Um, I think um, Te Reo or Ngāti Pro have definitely um, given me access to the doors that I have um, opened, uh, not only for myself, and I feel a great, um, great dedication. Um, I remember when many politicians come to my office and, and as the mayor, they said, Ming, come and join our party. Everybody said, come and join our party, except for the Green Party. and um, um, I would go back to my, my kahui pakeke in, at home and I said, oh, look, uh, so-and-so has asked me to join their party. And they said, no, no, Ming, you'd be here for us. And so I have um, stayed at home for all this time, 24 years on council. And I've been there working for our people because I, I know, the, I know the, um, the history of our place and I really wanted to make a difference and um, uh, uplift and support any moi moi are that our people have uh, in the Tairawhiti. So, koira. Thank you very much, Darren. Kia ora, Ming. Um, and, and I want to turn to also Justice Joe as well. Um, in terms of your personal um, relationships, I guess, looking at, at how, I guess, tangata are here, tangata whenua, and I also want to make mention to Tangata or Te Moana Nui Kiwa, you know, Pacifica peoples as well. In your personal um, experience and life, have you seen connections um, that really make you um, think about what, what um, that sort of relationship could look like or should look like? Hmm. Um, oh no, kia ora, Darren. Uh, kia koe no hoki e meng. Uh, te kitei ho ia koe. E hangari te haere ana tō āhua ki te rao Derek. Nō reire e mihi ake ana ki ākoe me, me te tangi ki o tātou mate. Uh, ki a wira uh, me e te heo ngā mate i tō kua kāinga ka tai anō nei ka tanu mia. Um, thanks Darren uh, and um, great to see you Ming. I was just saying to him in Māori that um, he's looking increasingly like um, his uh, spiritual relation, Derek Lardelli. Um, and, and the more I listen to him, the more Māori he sounds and the less Chinese he sounds, <laughs> which I suppose is what the Fenua does to us. And that's, um, I suppose, one of my key themes, um, that the thing about Aotearoa, stuck as it is in the bottom of the South Pacific, is that it has its own seductions um, and it doesn't really matter where you come from, in a sense, the whenua changes us all. Um, and it did to Māori, of course, because when Kupe arrived um, a thousand years ago, he wasn't a Māori. He was a Hawaiian. He became a Māori here, or at least his grandchildren did, because the whenua changed them. 
the Fenua invented our language, our songs, and our relationships with place. So we often forget the power of Fenua to um, one to change us, whether we're Maori or Pake or Pacifica or Asian, and two to bring us closer together. Um, and I think the seduction of Aotearoa um, is greater than most Fenua. Maybe that's because it's in the Pacific. There's something about it that stopped the English, the Scots, and the Welsh being English, Scots, and Welsh quite quickly and turned them into what they called Kiwis. Um, and um, did the same to Samoans and Tongans, Cook Islanders, and so on, and will probably do the same to Asians. Didn't stop them in the sense that they remembered their, their culture and expressed their culture, but changed that um, memory and expression into a memory and expression that fits the South Pacific. And that seems to me to be the key. Anyway, so um, I, uh, I remember, I'm old enough to remember like Ming, um, the 1970s, no, let me back up. Uh, for much of the last 180 odd years, the history of Aotearoa has been a Māori Pākehā history, been that binary, that simple binary in which um, the Pākehā narrative dominated and the Māori narrative was subordinated, subordinated as inferior uh, and ultimately doomed to extinction and that if Māori wanted to survive, they needed to learn Pākehā ways, not just the Pākehā language, but the Pākehā ways of, um, of living, of individualism, of the accumulation of capital and wealth and so on and so forth, and get rid of their tribal ways and their old non-Christian things because those were the very things that would hold them back in modernity. And um, after um, several um, generations of that being whipped into you, uh, many Māori uh, accepted that, many very prominent Māori accepted that as just the inevitable verdict of history. Uh, and even those who you might have said were, um, were the conservatives, the ones that wanted to hold on to as much as we could of who we are, even they understood that compromises had to be made in modernity. Um, and then in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, the Pacific Islanders came. The Samoans, the Tongans, in particular the Cook Islanders, filled up South Auckland, filled up Porirua, Tokoroa, um, and so on, filled up our freezing works, um, cheek by jowl with the Māori, filled up our pulp mill in Tokoroa, cheek by jowl with Māori. And um, none of you are probably old enough to remember that this caused an enormous, enormous social friction. The dawn raids of the 70s, the famous dawn raids of the 70s, uh, the view often shared by Māori that uh, the Pacific Islanders coming to New Zealand was stealing something from them. Um, that the risk that the Samoans and the Tongans in particular would be climbing over the top of them to get above them on the ladder. And somehow the biggest threat was to Māori because they were, all, they were on the bottom of the ladder then. So there was this enormous tension all of it driven by race, of course, and played wonderfully in the politics of the day, since it seems to be um, hardwired into us as social animals that in order to feel that we belong, we have to identify other, um, and we have to think negatively of other in order to feel positively of ourselves. But that changed, as we know, and those old tensions over the period of a generation faded away and what rose to the surface was an interesting phenomenon I think for me 
and that was that the arrival of the alternative narrative of the Polynesians, who weren't Māori, was to teach Pahia that there was other ways of expressing culture. It was to threaten the hegemony of the Pākehā narrative and ironically to give Māori permission to be Māori. And uh, the presence of people in New Zealand who spoke a language other than English in our urban areas, the in-your-face presence uh, in the sporting arena and so on, of really successful Polynesians of a demonstrably different culture uh, from the Pākehā culture made it easier to be Māori. And, uh, and so you saw the rise of Māori nationalism, of um, the memory of Māori language, the memory of Māori culture, at a time when it might be said, and many people were worried, that we could completely forget ourselves. So the Asian story fits into that uh, narrative, I think, that I see the presence of Chinese and Indians, Malaysians, uh, and so on, as empowering the Maori narrative by, the, by virtue of heterogeneity that aspect of heterogeneity, which is tangata whenua, becomes easier and easier to express. And partly because, as I've been listening to the conversations here, partly because you belong to other too. You are othered. And so you can empathize with the othering of us, us Māori. You understand what it's like to be uh, viewed negatively by the hegemon, because you are and have been for a very long time. So that provides um, a great opportunity for coalitions in which we each empower the other to be who we need to be, all the while seduced by the whenua, all of us into also being Pacific Islanders, because that's what we are. We live in the Pacific on these islands. We are by definition Pacific Islanders. In fact, we live on these islands at the bottom of Polynesia. We are by definition Polynesians, all of us. And that's the seduction of the Fenua. So the, the allying, of Asians, of Pacific Islanders, of Māori, uh, makes it easier for all of us to be who we are and makes it easier for all of us to accept the gentle seduction of the whenua. And in doing so, actually, we make it easier for Pahia to discover their Pahianess. That is, the nature of their culture uh, informed both by their Western roots, and by the gentle seduction of the Fenua, producing a new iwi that we would call Pākehā, that's not English, not Scottish, not even Western entirely, but is Pākehā. So um, that's my big dream. Who knows whether it'll work out? Sorry, that was a much longer lecture than I intended. And that I think is a very beautiful corridor. Um, and, and yeah, something that, that so I'm currently on my te reo journey and it is a privilege to be there um, in Te Wānanga Takiura. So much mihi to, um, to the Wānanga as well for, for you know, um, helping me with the reo. And also you as well, Justice Joe as well. Ngā mihi. Um, and it reminds me of a quote um, from this matua, Uncle Iroh, um, understanding others, the other elements, the other nations will help you become whole. This idea that you, and, and it's interesting because it's a fine line between saying, um, he iwi tahitato, which is not what is that saying, rather by understanding others, you're not being Maori from my point of view, but you are understanding. And so I wanted to turn to, um, to, to Matua Ming, particularly from a race relations point of view, um, you know, 
there are critiques about you know um, the human rights framework that's very individualistic that it's not necessarily something um, that is, that comes about um, from you know that from people of color or um, indigenous peoples to shape that BIPOC people. What are your thoughts on um, how these different groups relate to each other? Is it um, and any personal experiences or anything from your from your race relations role? I think you're, 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 you're muted, by the way. Interesting at the uh, commission now, uh, ever since I started, we, we started talking about not Māori, but Modi. Uh, Modi is a concept that um, you can't really separate anything uh, that is very inclusive um, because in the human rights, you have the Bill of Rights, uh, you have the human rights, you got the uh, United Nations um, Indigenous Rights. Uh, you've also got the United Nations um, develop, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And they all got components and they tend to treat them separately. Um, but we, we started a conversation about a couple of years ago on our Tariti journey in the uh, Commission. And what does it look like? And it doesn't have to be perfect in the beginning, but at least we've made a start. But we do talk about um, the Modi of our people here in Aotearoa. And just noting that our jurisdiction is just Aotearoa, uh, not to be uh, complicated by uh, intercontinental, intercontinental uh, global, global issues uh, that actually land in our doorstep. And there's many. Uh, from Palestine to Jewish to China to Hong Kong, China to Taiwan, the current Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict, the uh, uh, Kashmir Indian issues. And so they, those uh, geopolitical issues actually end up in our doorstep. We just got to be mindful that we actually stick to our knitting right here in Aotearoa because we've got 5 million people, there's plenty. And there's only one of us. And so um, when we begin this conversation, we ground Tiriti as the uh, founding document, the Modi of how New Zealand is and should be. And we, all, we say, um, when I go speech making, I say that we're actually living in a Maori country. And within this Maori country, there are another 100 plus countries within this country of Aotearoa and um, each iwi is their own country and like Uncle Api used to say look um, neither I don't make decisions for you and nor does Ngāti Whātua make decisions for us we actually stand here working together but definitely our mana is within our rohinga of our iwi and so um, when we try to um, extend it in terms of what, what does it mean in terms of human rights, it cuts across um, everything. And we are influenced um, by, by definitely the uh, Tariti, but we're influenced by the people and their needs and what is going to provide a better life of, e um, of equality for them, because at the present time, there needs to be a lot of equity uh, put into other areas, but the whole goal of uh, human rights is equality um, at the end of the day. And so the many issues that traverse our table, um, some, some areas there are actually more, more um, equal than others, but definitely we continue to uh, push the journey of equality right through. I'm working at, um, uh, as the uh, chair of uh, diversity inclusion at Te Pukenga, and they, they do have an equity issue, um, but they do need to actually try and get to the equality equation. Um, so at the present time, more resources um, and different ways of doing things need to be put at the coalface of Māori Pacific. Um, and uh, refugees um, coming into our 
um, country in the uh, tertiary education. And what I'm seeing in the in the country is the um, when we talk about colonization, I think it's, it's actually moving the other way. People don't feel that um, the Pagia people are actually being colonized um, by default. And they're actually feeling um, threatened, actually. They're feeling threatened of power, of the power um, balance that they used to enjoy. And what is being uh, seemingly, they think, has been taken away from them. But it's not really, because it's actually, we are trying, our country is trying to say, let's get to the, um, the flesh of what the Tariti said. And in between that, other than the uh, governance of your own lands and the Kawana uh, part, there's, there's a, uh, a middle part where we actually need to design a framework um, that is going to ensure that we can actually still live harmoniously uh, in Aotearoa and contributing to Aotearoa. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a continuous journey and it's a little bit at a time and I'm really enjoying it. I've only got two years to go. Thanks very much, Meg. Um, um, much or mainly, there's quite a lot um, in there um, to, to unpack. And, and I do want to head, um, touch on that in a little bit later, this idea of a, of a different framework of something that addresses things like decolonization, the past, and reconciling it, which is obviously the part of, of this hui. Um, but before getting there, I just wanted to touch on, so you talked about things like you know, the rights that pertain under Tatiti, even the idea of, of rights um, of iwi to be iwi as separate nations as well. Um, and I was wondering what are your, both of your um, whakaro on as non-signatories to Tatiti at the start for Asian peoples, what are the sorts of obligations do you think that come from this relationship um, to the land? Is it Tatiti Waitangi um, as, as Tanga Tatiti? Is there something more there based on the historical relationship? Um, did you have any thoughts on that? Both, both of you. Sure, Joe. I'm going to say that um, actually Māori came up with the Whakatoa of human rights way long time ago. And this was how to mea nui o tau. He tāngata, he tāngata, he tāngata. And you know, they didn't say which tāngata, but it was all tāngata, all peoples. And the beauty thing about that uh, whakatauaki, it actually is a um, embracing, including uh, whakatauaki that actually uh, supports our nationhood. And um, if, we, if we go... Um, back to um, the question in terms of what can we do? I think we, we as non-Māori um, have an obligation to support lifting Māori as much as possible, supporting Māori as much as, as much as possible and being allied to Māori as much as possible. Um, I I love um, the Māori world. Um, it, it, it resonates with my own family world, and that's why um, that whakawhanaungatanga, whānau, um, tauwhi, manaakitia, food, um, everything. Um, it resonates with uh, a lot of um, the newcomers that are coming into our nation. And we choose um, to come here. Um, so we shouldn't think, is it, why shouldn't we be here? The reason why we're here for my parents uh, was for better life um, other than China. Uh, they, the uh, Japanese invaded um, China back in the eight, uh, 1930s. And my, my, parent, my, my fam, father's family were refugees uh, going from Guangzhou to Hong Kong and ended up in Gisborne. There must have been Google back those days to find this place. But I, I have, like I said before, I have a huge obligation to support 
um, Taylor Fitty Māori as much as possible in all of my work and all of the policies in, in how we can actually uplift uh, Māori in, in our uh, rohinga. Um, so that is my obligation. And I, and I hope that, you know, what I see from the uh, Asian Lawyer Fraternity Network, um, that you have that for Karo as well. And it's great to see. And I know that um, our uh, tangata whenua, mana whenua, uh, they will look after us. And they have proven that they will look after us. Kia I think there are a uh, couple of things that are important. The, the, the point Ming made about um, mana aiwi, mana Māori and mana aiwi, the idea that, um, and it's an ancient idea that each valley has its own nationhood, is a deeply Māori idea, um, a deeply Polynesian idea, actually, where a village culture, by definition, um, is important and um, tauiwi of all descriptions need to do what they can to protect that, to empower and protect that self-determination um, because the survival of those people depends on self-determination. The ability to make decisions for yourself is uh, the most important form of wealth, I think. And that if the right to make decisions for your community is taken away from you, then you have, you are impoverished in the most fundamental way. Um, but beyond that, um, there is there is the wider Aotearoa narrative and the role of all Aotearoans in that narrative. Uh, as I've said elsewhere, when I was a kid, you growing up in the in the late sixties, you would be forgiven for believing that Aotearoa was somewhere anchored just off the coast of England. When I went to the movies, um, before the movie started, a band dressed up like the guards at Buckingham Palace played. Um, God Save the Queen, not God Defend New Zealand, God Save the Queen on screen and everybody stood up. Everybody stood up. Um, all the cars were English cars, unless they'd been the, were the ones brought in by the Americans during World War II. Um, and uh, Pākehā uh, parents and grandparents, even those who'd never been to the United Kingdom, called the UK home. That's how fundamental the colonial narrative was, even in my childhood, although it was fading as the country slowly drifted uh, in response to the magnetic pull of America and we became a client state of the Americans. And so you could be forgiven for thinking that we were somewhere around the mid-Atlantic drifting towards America. Now, that's all changed, I hope. Um, and I think we are in this process of change, much of it uh, actually being driven by your generation, um, Darren, um, as the country slowly drifts spiritually to where it is physically into the South Pacific. Um, and we have all to find our place as a Pacific nation, as a truly Pacific nation, to express our Pacifica tanga, if you like of which the core is, of course, the role of tangata whenua. But um, being of the Pacific means we need to learn different attitudes that are not, um, that are neither um, from the Western tradition, well, that, that are not from the Western tradition, that, uh, require us to relate to Fenua and Moana in a more intimate, more spiritual, more meaningful way. Uh, and actually, it turns out that's quite a good idea because if we don't do that, the planet may die. So 
um, so we have all to learn and take on the teachings of Maori ancestors because our identity and survival depends on it, even though most of us are not Maori. Because if you see the whenua as a mother, you don't abuse her. If you see the moana as an ancestor, you don't tip your rubbish into her. These are deeply Polynesian ideas that the West has long since forgotten. Perhaps Asia still remembers, but in the Pacific, these ideas are strong. So in a way, we're going through a process of counter-colonization of all New Zealanders, if we can say that, the repolonization of our attitudes, our ideas and our relationships. Now, I'll say one last thing, and in some ways, this is the most challenging thing. Um, it's not my idea, it was a thing that Tamati Kruger said to me that I found deeply challenging and very wise. Tamati Kruger is the chair of Tuhoi. He said, you know, if we all come to the understanding that we can't own the whenua, that the whenua is not property, that the whenua owns us, then we are all tangata whenua. Now that's a deeply challenging idea for Māori. But the decolonization of Aotearoa depends on us coming to that understanding. Once we do, we are going to renegotiate our relationships. And that negotiation will be a joyful negotiation, not a conflict. Anyway, something to think about. It's a very big thing to think about. Thank you. Um, and I like how, how, how there are, there's this talk about, you know, this future relationship, which is obviously something, you know, that was asked to, to judge Tan as well. You know, you both touched on, I think, values, whether that's the Pacific the Polynesian values of the land, um, of the Moana, and um, um, Matua Meng as well, in terms of things like Manakitanga and Fanangatanga that you said had resonated with you. Um, moving on from moving from values, how do these translate to both of your respective roles, or at least your past role? Um, I mean, in terms of the politics and the law, um, which um, can sometimes be very two very challenging um, areas. And, and by that I mean, for instance, in the idea that everyone is tangata whenua, what, what does that mean politically? And has it always been challenging politically? Um, because does that, you know, bring the whole idea that we're all one peoples and that's it? Um, and what does that change maybe look like in the law? Um, obviously, we've spoken before, Justice Show, on things like decolonizing the law um, when Titanga is being recognized in law and as law. Um, yeah, and I was wondering what you, both your perspectives are on, on taking these values and actually translating them into, um, and I think, you know, someone has asked the question, you know, these colonial institutions or historically colonial institutions and probably presently are. Um, um, well, um, certainly these structures, including the judicial structure, was designed to protect the status quo and to protect the colonial hegemon in that status quo, obviously. Um, anyone who's read the law reports will tell you that. Um, but the challenge, of course, is that law, law must, in the end, reflect social and cultural change, or it dies. Um, or it becomes totalitarian and eventually dies. Because you can only keep the people down for so long if they don't want to be kept down. So um, the, over the last generation, the law has been attempting to decolonize very timidly to start with, and perhaps less timidly now, but it is still fundamental 
to the legal project that it is conservative and um, regressionary if it can get away with it. Um, but it, the, the law, for example, has accepted now the life of tikanga as a component of the law. It had to. It's not that the law was particularly far-seeing or progressive, quite the reverse, in fact. The law was, the, always, as always, the last to see that that change had already occurred. Um, so uh, it's a challenge to deconstruct institutions designed for a particular purpose to achieve a different purpose, always. But um, the advantage we have in Aotearoa is, is that the law is more organic here than in most other places. We don't have a written constitution that locks in a status quo. As it turns out, that might have been a good idea. Um, and so uh, we, we, are, we are slowly unpicking the things of the past that no longer suit us in the now. The challenge is going to be to unpick those things from the past that will no longer suit us in the future. And to do that, we have to be able to have a vision of that future, of who we want to be, say in 2040, 200 years after the treaty. And that's, that's really difficult. So yes, the courts are a deeply colonial institution, just as the parliament is, as the cabinet is, uh, in fact, as local government is. Um, but the, the great hope arises from the fact that the law must, uh, the judiciary and the law must respond to social change and the social change has already happened. The judges are just trying to catch up with it. So um, we, we at the uh, commission are going to do something um, different. Um, we're looking at having uh, co-governance so our chief commissioner will be the chief commissioner and we want a indigenous Maori commissioner of equal standing, uh, equal responsibilities um, at the commission. And we're also um, seeing if the law allows us to have a dual CEO, two CEOs. Um, and so uh, that's going to be an interesting um, challenge for us. And I think it comes down to um, clarity and working relationships of how we can work together without fear or favor, without one person having more power than the other. And so um, that's going to be an interesting thing. I remember um, when, uh, when at uh, one of the Hiru Harama Marae, um, Dr. Kapunga Juice, uh, Paul Juice, says, you know, um, he said, not everything you bring is bad, Ming. Not everything you bring is bad. There's some good things that we want to keep. And so, you know, it's, a, it's going to be a, a bit of a mix. Um, the fruit salad sort of um, idea that there is um, uh, aspects of Māori room that is awesome. And these aspects of um, the Western, Eastern views are awesome. And then there's the juice that runs on the bottom. And that's the part that will bind everything together. Um, I think once we, and, and I've heard that I, uh, uh, the same uh, corridor from um, uh, Tamati Kruger as well, Jim, the concept of the whenua having owning, or not quite owning us, but uh, whatever the interpretations are, but no one owns the whenua. And uh, when, I, when, when I actually asked <laughs> when Tūru Wera was actually returned, um, I said, ah, oh, uh, do you guys own the Uru Wera now? And he said, no, we don't. No one owns it. No one owns it. 
what he said was the Uruwera actually owns us. And so um, what a beautiful um, idea organically to actually work from. Um, and I think um, we have responsibilities um, spreading the word, so to speak, in every forum that we go to, that we sow these little ideas, big ideas, futuristic ideas into people's minds so they can actually start thinking about it. But also giving some analogies of how, how actually it works because um, sometimes these big things are too difficult for people. And one of the reasons why I, I thought I was really successful in, um, as the mayor of Gisborne is because I could actually have, tell a story that people can actually relate to and understand and contribute to. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting conversation, but I think we start with ourselves first. We start with our organizations first before we actually sow any other seeds because people would say, well, you're telling us all this, what are you doing? And so what I'm doing, at, what we are doing at the Human Rights Commission is having a Tadisi based organization of, um, from governance to uh, management. And um, yeah, so far it's been working every time, it's, it's hard work. Every time we have new staff, we have to have a wire number and um, let them know that this is what we're doing. And in actual fact, we've gone a bit further. We said um, in the job applications now, you, you are going to be part of this uh, new model and uh, you, you have to like it to actually participate in it if you don't, don't apply for the job. Thank you both. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. So I just wanted to, to um, touch on the first one and, and fold it. Um, sorry, the second one in terms of um, 2040, because you've both talked about, um, firstly, um, Matua Ming, you, you've, you've spoken on things like co-governance um, and also even further back, the idea of you know each iwi as a nation. Um, and Justice Joe, you talked about um, things like our constitution being so malleable. Um, one of the things with, with 2040, 200 years from Te Tiriti Waitangi, um, a very co contemporary issue that we heard from the, from the first set of speakers is around something like tr constitutional transformation, the type about, you know, Matiki Mai, um, where instead of just around co-governance, it's going that little bit further to recognize, I guess, what was promised and things like he whakaputanga and sovereignty of each, you know, hapu even, um, and each iwi. How do you sort of see that future relationship play out um, in the constitutional sphere, um, given how much um, it's been, you know, um, something that everyone's really talking about uh, or seems to be talking about things like the hey, poor, poor report. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to do a focado on, on that constitution, constitutional transformation side of things. Did you hand it over to me, Ming? <laughs> I couldn't see. I was looking at I was looking at the questions online. Um, yes, the great question of twenty forty uh, in the context of um, a world transforming before our very eyes. Um, a world in which the geopolitical center of gravity is in fact moving to the Pacific. Um, a shift from the time when uh, I think in the, in the, in the time of um, Helen Clark, where the security assessment was that we lived in an incredibly benign security environment, Pacific's exactly that, highly peaceful, um, and all the troubles are elsewhere, mostly in the Middle East. That's completely flipped. Asia is rising. America is afraid. Europe is on fire. Um, and China um, reaches 
its military and political arm into the Pacific to do exactly what the Americans did in the 19th century when they took the Philippines and Hawaii. So, um, so the next 20 years are going to be very, very interesting times, particularly for you guys rather than for Ming and I, um, as the center of gravity moves to our backyard. And we have our own domestic issues as we've been discussing them, but they are going to play out in this very different geopolitical context in which um, the Asian economy inevitably begins to um, outstrip and then dwarf the North American economy. And, uh, and we are a mouse sleeping with elephants and afraid we'll wake them up. So um, the Asian presence in Aotearoa is going to be very important because the 21st century is the Asian century, of course, and the Pacific is its backyard. Um, so how do we how do we express our our Aotearoa in 2040? with all of that going on around us? Well, the first point is that we must express our Aotearoa tanga because our Ingarangi tanga and our America tanga will become anachronisms. Unless we decide to be fearful of that shift and do what the Australians do, just pick a side. Um, so I think over the next 20 years, the Asian component of Aotearoa will become increasingly important culturally and politically. I remember um, uh, Minister of Māori Affairs, Peter Sharples, headed a trade delegation to China and they met with can't remember whether it was the premier at the time. He was certainly a very senior member of the Chinese government who said, ah, Maoris, good, you have culture. And so Aotearoa was not seen as a part of the beige um, colonial Western arc of North America, Australasia, and so on, seen as something a bit different. And I think it's gonna be very important for us to embrace that and to build on it. You know, I think constitutional conversations are wonderful, of course, and the younger you are, the more important and idealistic, uh, the more idealistic you are, and the more important these conversations are, but I'm old. And I've seen this go round and round and round since I was your age and screaming for a treaty-based constitution, just like uh, you guys probably are, and certainly your Maori colleagues are. Um, but what I've learned is that um, uh, almost every constitution, every conversation is a constitutional conversation, um, and that things change on the ground and then they become reflected in the law. And sometimes they become reflected in a constitutional understanding, sometimes not, but things change on the ground anyway. And my great um, example of that is um, this national anthem of ours, which in my day used to be God defend New Zealand, but isn't anymore, it's Ea Ihoa. Um, and I asked myself once, when did that change? When did uh, people start singing the national anthem of my country in Māori? Because they certainly didn't do it when I was a kid. Um, and it started in the, the late 80s, early 90s, um, and then took off, of course, and now it's unthinkable that you would sing the New Zealand national anthem only in English and perfectly thinkable that you would sing it even only in Māori. 
But the interesting thing is no one directed that. No government official said from now on. And that indicates a country searching for itself and finding itself in Te Reo Māori. without a constitutional conversation. The recognition of the personality of Whanganui and the personality of Te Uriwera is a demonstration of a country searching for itself and finding itself in whanaungatanga, kinship with the whenua, with the land. And so on and so on, incrementally, these things seem to be building. Each time, by way of a constitutional conversation that no one's declaring has started or ended, but is going on anyway. So, um, um, Matike Mai is great. And I, I suspect that if we got a whole bunch of people in the room and said, okay, what should our constitution look like and where should the treaty be, there'd be an almighty punch up. But the change is going on on the ground anyway. Um, and the danger of political conversations, constitutional conversations like that, is that they become political footballs for those at the margins. And they kill the organic nature of the changes that are occurring before us. I'm not saying that shouldn't happen. I'm just saying we should be careful about what we wish for when our experience in this country has been that these changes have occurred incrementally and often before people realize they've occurred. Uh, so by 2040, I expect that process to have accelerated considerably because of the changes going on around us, because of the rise of the Asian demograph. And I'm hoping that um, this brings us closer together and strengthens a desire to express our Polynesian tanga, all of us as citizens of these islands. Once we do that, the recognition of mana Māori in the Māori sphere and the place of mana Māori in the wider national narrative will be, I think, safe, even if the way we express it might will change generation upon generation and will be debated. Thank you. <laughs> um, I remember Uncle Aki um, saying a prayer. And the prayer is went uh, something like this uh, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And um, as, I, as I look at that prayer in terms of the difficulties of changing what we have at the government end and the structural end, I am warmly heartened uh, to know that the Māori economy will be the change. Those are, the Māori economy is where Māori of each iwi, of each incorporation, of each whenua trust, they can control and make decisions to grow the Māori economy. And Māori business will be the biggest businesses in Aotearoa going uh, forward in years to come. And the primary reason for that is because they still, they don't sell the land. They hold on to the land, they could lease it, but they actually go into partnerships with people and, and then they become autonomous. I remember um, Tumanako uh, Wirata uh, from Wokai to Oropaki. Um, we went to visit his um, incorporation. He was telling us they only got back about 300 acres. Um, it was contact energy and then the contact energy was going to sell it. But 
uh, through the Public Works Act, they said, no, 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 you don't sell it to anyone, you've got to give it back to us. And so they got the land back and cut a long story short, from nothing to being in partnership with an Israeli company to build a, a geothermal uh, generation plant that powers the whole of um, Hamilton and to have uh, Miraka uh, as the milk processing plant, is to have the largest glass houses in New Aotearoa and to have Wagyu cows and all sorts of things. Um, it's only about five years ago when they reached a billion billion dollars, um, Uncle rang up and says, look, um, Ming, uh, we're going to have governance now. Some people suggested we get a board to run our affairs. I said, oh, well, come home. But before that, they sat around the table as um, the, um, the trust, and they just ran affairs like that. But I'm just saying, they've gone over a billion, they're probably one and a half billion dollars in assets. And this is only a small um, um, Māori trust and corporation. And we have a look at the um, landscape since the Treaty of Waitangi claims uh, have been settled, that the number of iwi up over one and a half, heading to two billion dollars in um, their affairs. And uh, my my good friend um, Peter, uh, Peter Cross, Ratahi Cross, uh, part of the um, the kiwi fruit industry, largest owners of um, kiwi fruit Māori in Aotearoa, and continuing to grow. And I feel really warm and uh, satisfied that in years to come the economics influence of Māori will change the uh, structures um, that are there at the present time. Um, you just have a look at the, and Joe mentioned, you know, our largest trading partner is China and the influence of trade. That is huge. But I'm, I'm very proud of um, Aotearoa. I think we, Māori grounds us. Māori concept, kawanga tikanga, grounds us in Aotearoa. Uh, we're able to, you know, stand up against America and says, no more nuclear ships coming here, nuclear free. Man, from that day to now, even uh, Prime Minister John Key's playing golf with Obama a few times, we have still not got a free trade agreement with America. You know, in, in the uh, narrative that um, um, our uh, current Minister of uh, foreign, uh, foreign Affairs um, promotes, has been centered on what is good for Aotearoa. We don't actually worry about too much about the other noise, noises that actually are coming through. So personally, the things that you can control Māori can control is the economy, and um, the economy is the influence, I believe, going future. So I'm hoping to live to um, 2040. We'll both be about 80 by then, and I hope that, you know, you and I will be on our togo togo, and we'll be able to front that, um, the uh, celebration of Te Riti or Waitangi at um, uh, Waitangi grounds. Um, there and um, the most important thing now is to stay alive. <laughs> <Kia ora. laughs> well, thanks very much, both of you. Now, um, I think quite a few um, audience members have upvoted just one last question um, that is um, quite important. So, it's, I have a question um, around the cultural competency of the judiciary for Justice Joe, with Māori, um, Pacific peoples, and Asians. We all face a judiciary that does not look like us to some degree, that does not understand us. This poses a particularly acute issue in instances where culture needs to be a key factor of judicial consideration. For example, in domestic violence cases involving ethnic women, which is something that actually one of our papers um, presenting later this afternoon will touch on, who are regularly failed by the judiciary who impose Eurocentric understandings of individuality to such cases, what future do you see for the judiciary in terms of cultural competency? Um, 
great question. Great question. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the challenges uh, going forward for the judiciary. The judiciary is uh, not diverse anywhere, anywhere near enough. Uh, sorry, that was bad English, but you get what I mean. Um, it's amazing. I don't think there is um, a single Asian judge in the senior courts. Um, I, I can't think of a, a Chinese or Indian or um, South East Asian judge uh, at all, which is um, Justice Jagos, really? Well, uh, yeah, I suppose, yeah. I suppose that's right. Or, well, shall I say um, um, a connected one? Um, and that's uh, really not acceptable. I, I'm trying to think whether there is a, a Pacific Island senior courts judge. Someone might remind me, not one comes presently to my mind. The, one of the big challenges uh, among Māori, and there, of course there are very few Māori judges, um, is how do they, how do those Pākehā judges get to uh, judge tikanga when they have no idea what tikanga is? And that, you know, that's a really, really good question. So right across the board, there are challenges as to whether the New Zealand judiciary is fit for purpose in the South Pacific. Um, and all I can say is the answer to that question right now is no, emphatically, and that needs to change by 2040. Um, the Asian legal network needs to play its part in um, advocating for a judiciary that reflects them as well as the rest of New Zealand. Um, and of course more tangata whenua and so forth. This project of decolonization cannot succeed without the face of the New Zealand judiciary changing relatively significantly over the next 20 years. That's going to take some patience on all of our parts, but it's by no means unachievable. <laughs>